you come to prayer with me this morning? All embracing and loving God, we thank you for the day that you've brought to us. Open our hearts and open our minds and let us be the receptors of the words that are about to be spoken. But also mold and transform and help guide us through the words this morning. Let these words come to life as they will ever be. I ask now that you would touch my lips of clay and mold them into the words that need to be spoken on this day and the words that come from my mouth and the meditations that come from each and every one of our hearts. May they ever be acceptable to you. In Christ we pray. Amen. 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 So I love the way the reading was done this morning. It was just one of those like announcers, you know, over a over a radio type of a thing. But over the last several weeks, we've been on this Advent journey. We've been exploring the various ways of lighting the way through our unfamiliar peace, through our unclear hope, and our unrevealed joy. And with Christmas just less than a week away, we come to that stop in our journey where we look and discover that unknown love that is about to cast down upon us. You might even call this the Advent Love Sunday. It's usually at this point that we hear in scriptures that lend around God's love for us and how God has promised to bear, promised, through, promised us through the prophet Isaiah that a virgin will conceive and bear a son who will be known as Emmanuel or God with us. So let's take a look at some back history here. We have Mary who is engaged to Joseph and some biblical translations will use the word betrothed, which in ancient biblical times means entering into a binding contract. Now for those of you who have your mind in the gutter, it's not that kind of binding contract. So binding in those days were, it was a contract where it was drawn when a groom and a bride were about to get married, and it was a contract stating that they hadn't been together, they haven't slept together, you know, they've done all the pure things to become a couple in the legal eyes of the government and the land. And it was also during that time that if you had done any of that, it was grounds for canceling that contract of marriage between the couple. So as our story continues, Joseph learns that all of a sudden Mary is with child, even though the couple had not been intimate in any shape or form. So instead of lending any embarrassment to Mary, Joseph decides to send Mary back to her family, kind of through the back streets and the back roads, so word doesn't get out all of a sudden that she's bearing a child. But if you recall any of the, your past Bible stories, but God wasn't going to have that. God had other plans for them and had decided to take other steps and intervenes with Joseph sending Mary back to her family. In turn, while Joseph is sleeping, God sends an angel to him and this angel explains that the child Mary is going to conceive was conceived by the Holy Spirit. So, you know, that probably was freaking Joseph out a bit, you know, but still was told that the Spirit had brought this child and just as the prophets had predicted previously, what happened? Now, I think at any time, anybody would freak out saying, saying, oh, well, you know, these immaculate conception, but, you know, the angels came down and, you know, as we all learn, the angels kind of have the facts and figures. But now Joseph is also instructed to continue the journey, taking his now wife, Mary, to Bethlehem, where this child is to be born and called Emmanuel. So maybe lots of folks might have strong doubts about this message that this angel comes down and in one's dream is telling us what's going to happen to the world. But thankfully, having this unknown love for his wife Mary, Joseph is obedient to what the angels tell him or the angel tells him and follows suit. So what we're seeing in the early stages of this unknown love is that Joseph has conceived 
not only for Mary, uh, it's conceived as love not only for Mary, his new wife, but this child who wasn't even born yet, let alone the great things that this child was about to bring to so many people throughout the world. As the story continues to unfold, God continues to talk to Joseph through these dreams. So a lot of what Joseph got were these messages through his dreams spoken from God. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, Herod, or King Herod to be more accurate, is hearing this news and is going on this rampage that this is all happening and orders for any newborn male, let alone Jewish newborn males, <clears throat> to be killed. So God continues working through Joseph in his dreams and gives Joseph more marching orders and basically says, you need to get the you-know-what out of Dodge and move on. So as we progress later in time, scripture which we see that Joseph is a very quiet man. And after these journeys and all that, we start seeing that we hear in other parts previously, we hear through Isaiah, and we heard some of it this morning, that Isaiah tells the story of Ahaz, who is identified as King Jehoahaz, Jehoaz, I can't get that out all these years, um, and is Ahaz is wanting this sign from God. And as we heard in scripture this morning, is looking for a particular sign to know what's going on. In fact, we find this response reaffirmed throughout gospel, through the stories of the 40 days that Jesus spent in the wilderness after his baptism, when Satan tempts Jesus, and all the other stories through Jesus' life from birth all the way through his death. But biblical scholars interpret Ahaz's motives as being something very different and describes this as an act of evil or wrongdoing. And it leaves traces and signs of love, but rather an unknown love. So through all of this, Ahaz keeps asking God for this sign. Where is this sign you keep telling me about? And finally, the sign is offered through this new child that is about to be born to Mary and Joseph. We also see throughout much of this that, like I said, Joseph just kind of remains silent. He's kind of this kickback, quiet guy, doesn't say a lot, but he just sits there. But at the same time, God has this trust in Joseph. And then having his love for not only his wife Mary, but this newborn child that's coming, this unknown bundle of love for so many of us, that receiving this child is going to bring unknown love to each and every individual that God has created. So right now this child's about to be born and this unknown love that we don't know about is floating through the air. Joseph is getting these messages through his dreams from God of what's going on and is obeying the land, the, the delay of the land of how God's putting him. In my my opinion, Joseph is being given this strength from God while at the same time receiving it from himself, knowing that the love that God is giving him is giving him that strength to be the guardian and protector of what God's greatest gift is to be given to humankind. It's through Joseph's actions that we are taught the values of this remaining steadfast in our faith and our devotion by listening and accepting and immediately obeying the word of God while we carefully deal with all the other inconvenient implications in our own lives on a daily basis. So it's kind of a balancing act. You see, we are given so much unconditional love that half the time it's unknown love to us because we don't realize it's there. And that unknown love from the conception that we pass down is trickled. And it's there and we don't see it, but it starts becoming unveiled little by little. So many times we take for granted those opportunities where these unknown loves come into our life each and every day. These unknowns that might become, the, in most cases, 
reality in our own personal lives. It is these unknown loves that God plants inside of us, planting the seeds when we least expect it. In all honesty, I think this love that God brings to us is not just during the Christmas tide season, but is throughout the year, and we don't realize that. God lays aside the, th- the throne and through Jesus becomes one of us. Think about that. God sets everything aside and is a part of us. As we are created in God's image, God now becomes part of us. So much that the fact that this incredible and beautiful and sombering news that there can be only one response, that the love of God for all of our hearts and souls and mind and strength to love one another in the way that God loves us. And I want to repeat that, that the the only one response is that to love God with all of our heart and our soul and our mind and our strength and to love one another with all of our hearts. Now, if you listen to that phrase, that phrase was used a few months ago when we were in our other series, when we were going through the Beatitudes and all the things that God brings of that love. Love is the, if you really look at it, love is the most important part of the Christmas story. It's not the birth of Jesus. It is, but it's not the main thing. It's not all the gifts that come from the wise men and all that as we go through the years, but it's the love that comes at Christmas. It's that love that God brings to each and every one of us through that hope, through that peace, and through that joy that we all need. And most of all, it's the love that we have for one another through the gifts that God brings us. That's what makes Christmas worth every moment we share of it. It's the love that we provide. So this week as we start preparing for next Saturday and Sunday, oh my God, I can't believe it's a week away. Are you ready? Are all your shopping done and all your everything wrapped under the tree? Not mine. I'm like, just about got Christmas up this weekend. Um, but look at it in a different perspective. I found something this week that um, kind of blew me away um, when I was uh, looking at the uh, commentaries and the uh, other, other sermons that other pastors have written through the years just to get some sermon ideas. Um, I came across this in, in um, someone's sermon, I forgot whose it was, um, that I found online, but it's a paraphrase of 1 Corinthians 13, and it goes something like this. I think it kind of fits in too a little bit. If I decorate my house perfectly with plaid bows, strands of twinkling lights and shiny balls, but do not show the love to my family, I'm just another decorator. If I slave away in the kitchen, baking dozens of Christmas cookies, preparing gourmet meals, and arranging a beautifully adorned table at mealtime, but don't show the love to my family, I'm just another cook. If I work at the soup kitchen, carol in the nursing homes, and give all that I have to charity, but do not show love to my family, it, its profits mean nothing. If I trim the spruce with shimmering angels and crocheted snowflakes, how many remember those as a kid, your grandmother knitting crocheted snowflakes, attend a myriad of holiday parties and sing the choir's cantata, but do not focus on Christ, I've missed the point. Love stops the cooking to hug a child. Love sets aside the decorating to kiss another. Love is kind through the harried and the tired. Love doesn't envy another's home that has coordinated Christmas china and table linens. Love doesn't yell at the kids to get out of the way. Love doesn't even give only to those who are able to give in return, but rejoices in the giving to those who can't. Love bears all things, believers, believes in all things, and hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never fails, 
video games will break, pearl necklaces will be lost, and golf clubs will rust. But giving the, but giving the gift of love will endure. So stop clutching those pearls around your neck. The gift of love will endure. And indeed, that's what Christmas is all about. Taking that unknown love in our lives and making it the known love that Christ gives us each and every day. So take that into the, into the week as we come, as we, un, as we go to the unexpected Christ on Saturday and then on Sunday, the revealed Christ that comes to us as the, new, as the, as the Christ child comes back into our lives. So think about that, because this will stem into part of next week's uh, sermon on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, how that love comes to us and how that, how that unexpected child becomes a part of our life. Amen. Amen.